Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Talos of Tech live on Twitch. Hope you guys enjoyed today's controversial video because apparently I'm the only one who thinks the Apple TV remote doesn't need a U1 chip because their kids like to take their TV remote outside. <sighs> yeah, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think they shouldn't design things for every single use case necessarily. The most is possible, but if it results in the remote getting more expensive, then... Nah, I'll take the speaker over the U1 chip every day of the week. Thank you, uh, that name is taken for the 28 months of Twitch Prime. Holy crap, that's a long time. Um, also, I don't know how to say your name. O underscore 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 D says, has your iPad and iMac shipped? I believe my iPad has, which I'm very excited about because iPad is probably my favorite part of the new event. And I'm very happy that it's actually going to work with my old Magic Keyboard case. Uh, yeah, my iPad says shipped and should uh, be delivered by May 21st. My iMac has not shipped, which I honestly don't care about because it's the iMac and I don't, I'm not excited to see it. Um, I feel like if I never looked at it, everybody would critique me. So that's why I'm looking at it to give you guys a fair in-person impressions uh, videos. But yeah, my iMac has not shipped, which I'm fine with that. If it never ships, I'll be fine. But I did want to talk about what a few people were uh, tagging me on Twitter about um, when it came to these Cell Cell research uh, done by, well, Cell Cell's new product survey offers uh, insights into consumer behaviors um, between the new AirTags, the new iPad Pro, the 24-inch iMac. Um, kind of explains a lot if we look into these numbers. Um, so yeah, Cell Cell. So one is like sell a product, the next one is like plant cell put together but um only 14 percent of respondents they did over 3,000 iphone and ipad owners so lots of ios users aged 18 years or older so we're not pulling the kids here um based in the united states to gather its data and they said only 14 percent of the respondents wanted to buy the 24 inch imac which uh i guess somewhat makes sense you know the desktop market is not huge um, but still, that's a lot of iPhone and iPad owners they pulled. And in my opinion, somewhat of a small percentage that would be interested. But okay, I'll try. I'll do my best to not make another stream just about the iMac. Um, but they did mention that blue was the most popular color option. Also made sense. That's what it was back in the uh, original iMac days in the 90s. 33.4% uh, of people wanting to get the new iMac uh, chose blue. Silver was the second most popular at 30%, and then green at 13%, and the least popular color options are yellow, pink at 4%, and orange at 3%. Wow, I didn't expect orange to be the bottom one. I thought uh, orange would be a bit higher than that, but that reminds me. I want to compare to the polls I have on my channel because I... I hate to break it to you, but I probably pulled more people than they did. <laughs> so I'm going to find it um, because I was asking people which color I should get. So I don't know if that counts as what color most people want. But uh, I do some of my own polling here. I do find it interesting. We we polled over 15,000 people on how they like their MacBooks. And 86% were leaning towards black bezels and black keyboard, which I thought was cool. Um, down here... I, did, I got different results than they did. They were saying, um, what was it? They said orange was 3%, pink was 4%, and yellow was 6%. So yellow, pink, orange. But then for me, it was blue and silver, obviously, in the lead. And then pink, orange, yellow. So I wonder why my audience was more in favor of pink and orange. I think it's because pink looks pretty red. Like if you go to the website um, and you just see the red from behind. Yeah, see from like this side angle, it looks very deep, dark red. And I like that color. But from the front, it looks more like the dock where it's all pinkish. And I don't think people dig the pink desktop look very much. Um, yeah, see, it's, I don't know. From behind, it's fine. But that's not what matters most yeah there you go look at that now that's gorgeous if this image would have leaked i would have been so excited i would have been so pumped if i just knew that this was what the back of the updated imac was gonna be i'd be like oh. i mean the ports kind of suck but <laughs> like holy crap that looks amazing that looks so beautiful 
I'd see this angle too, and I'd be like, oh, wow, it looks so gorgeous. And then someone would go into the fine nitty gritty details and be like, wait, Drew, this isn't a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Embrace the chin. No! Chin to the minimum to the max, 14, 17. Uh, it could be skewed because people wanted blue for the tech channel, so those people didn't vote for other colors. Yeah, but these people are also seeing blue become the most popular, so I, I think that's partially just the natural color option that most want to go with. Looking back here, um, let me pick a different color. I need a better way to switch these. Yeah, the, the light blue is kind of likable from the front, approachable, I guess. I'm talking uh, purely color-wise. I'm not talking design-wise. Yeah, that looks nicer, too. I like the, the color combo. It's kind of like AirPods Max colors, you know. Dark blue, light blue on the logo in the dock. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a, that's a decent combination. I think it deserves to be the most popular color option. Silver, I also get because that's probably... If you hate these new colors, silver is probably your safest bet because it's all light gray. Except everyone likes to correct me that the bezels aren't actually white. They're actually light gray bezels. So this is just darker gray, light gray, and black line, and then pixels. And the dock is almost a different shade, too. It's very... Yeah, I don't. When people say that the old black bezels or old gray Max are too boring, I, I want to point them to this. Is this an exciting, fun design to you? <laughs> <laughs> It's like the most neutral, basic. I would call that boring and ugly. They found a way to check both those boxes. <laughs> See, we're doing all the iMac hate at the beginning now. That way, the rest of the stream will be fine. Um, please make a lot of B-roll for the magnetic power cable. Okay, I'll pay attention to that. Um, let's see. From behind, the whole iMac is fine. Yeah, I agree. Um, but let's look at the rest of this uh, report because I want to talk more about IMAX on Twitch. That's pretty much all we've done for the past three weeks. Okay, uh, so we got the new colors. Um, ooh, that's interesting. This suggests that the majority of IMAX customers are not interested in most of the new color options. Pretty much the majority of them chose either no color or blue. And the rest were kind of like, eh, who cares? I'm surprised green was pretty high for them. I didn't care for the green one. Anyway, 61% of iPhone and iPad users intend to buy an AirTag. Interesting. That's a pretty high number in my opinion, um, considering my data was pretty different. Yeah, see, down here we got 16,000 votes over three weeks. This is like over five times the amount of people polled compared to Cell Cell. Um, I asked what their game plan is. There are probably a lot of people in the comments here that are going to say things like, I'm not getting one tonight, but I'll get them later. Yeah, this is the top comment. Um, from Sorush HD says, if there was a, I will not buy them just yet, but maybe in two months option, I would vote it. Um, I'm working from home. How can I possibly lose anything? That's me. I'll give him a like. That's that's the comment I agree with. <laughs> um same with Irad. He says, it's a great product. I have no use of it as I lose nothing. All my stuff is either on my table, in my pocket, or in my bag. Most of the stuff I misplace personally typically is, is stuff that's already connected. I'm usually looking for my iPad or my phone or my AirPods. It's not really like non-techy things. Um, but on my chart here, I found this pretty interesting. There were actually more people planning on buying four AirTags than there were people buying one which means that most people are going for the value proposition of getting $100 worth of AirTags, getting four, instead of getting one AirTag for $30. So I guess if you can think of four things to attach them to, it makes sense. But what I thought was genius about that AirTag pricing was that I could not think of four things most people do. I, I think of three. I think the magic number for most people is going to be three items, like keys, backpack, and like a pet. Or that's actually what this um, article dove into here. But yeah, pretty pretty high number. 61%, they probably phrased this a little better than I did. They were saying they intend to buy an AirTag eventually. So they're maybe not pre-ordering an AirTag and getting one right away. But they found out about it. They heard about the AirTag and went, yeah, I'll probably get one of those someday. 54% um, feel that the AirTag is a good deal. That's pretty high, especially considering this is an Apple product. And 32% uh, feel it is reasonably priced. Wait. Is there a difference? Reasonably priced and good deal? Why are those two separate questions? I don't get that. Whatever. 
Um, just fourteen percent feel that it is overpriced. Really? I'm surprised there are fourteen percent of people that think thirty dollars for a Apple equipped U1 device with a speaker and an over year long battery life that has the Find My network. They find out about twenty nine dollars and they're like, <laughs> gross, too expensive. Maybe the only way I could see that is people saying that, well, it should have the little keyhole. I shouldn't have to buy the keychain separately. And maybe the keychains are overpriced. That's that I could see a, like 90% of people agreeing. Like, yeah, that Hermes crap. Yeah, it's overpriced. Um, among AirTag buyers, 57% are going for the $99 four pack option. Wow. So that's very similar to my poll as well. A lot of people th seeing it as, well, I better buy four of them instead. That's how they get you guys is they figure out how much you need and then they put in one more and then figure out the best way to make it look like the better deal. When in reality, you're spending three times as much. If you would just buy three air tags, you would still be saving money technically. Um, with the other 43% buying them individually for $29, showing a fairly even split. Yeah, makes sense. 42.5% uh, of AirTag buyers intend to track their keys. That makes sense. That's the most common one. 34% uh, intend to track pets. That's pretty high, actually, despite Apple disavowing this. I noticed that, too. Apple was mentioning that like AirTags are not meant to track uh, pets. But my guess, I think uh, Cyber Octoling has probably already br uh, brought this up. Um, the, the truth is Apple probably just doesn't want to be held liable for if you attach this to a pet and then you lose your pet and you can't track the air tag down so they have to actively say like hey don't use this to track your pets i mean you can they make collars and stuff so for liability reasons they obviously don't want to tell people hey you should attach this to your dog and stuff because with apple they're going to get sued over everything and you know they, they got sued over wallpaper over the iphone 10s so that they get sued over everything so making sure that you disclose like hey this is for tracking down items not people and pets are people too in a way for some people they're pets that's a new poll let's get your guys's answer in the chat are pets people or are pets animals or both but yeah you, you a lot of people saying they plan on attaching their AirTag to pets directly against Apple's recommendation, which is interesting. 30% um, want to track luggage. That makes sense. 25% intend to track bikes. That's actually pretty high, considering I have not seen a ton. Have you guys seen a ton of like AirTag third-party accessories that allows you to attach them directly to your bike? Or are there just like 25% of people just duct-taping these to their bike? I don't know. I feel like you don't really misplace or lose your bike. It typically gets stolen. And I'm pretty sure air tags are not great for theft because they're going to notify whoever stole the item that they're being, they're carrying someone else's air tag and they can deactivate them. But interesting that a lot said they were interested in tracking their bike. 23% um, want to track their purse or wallet. That's pretty high. If you consider that, you know, the air tag doesn't fit into a lot of different wallets. Other popular intends, uh, Intended uses include tracking AirPods cases, children, vehicles, drones. Drones I get, but children, I'm like, what, where are you going to attach it? You're going to have like a air tag that they just keep in their pocket or do you like sew it into their clothing or, or partners? That's an odd one. I want to know where my partner is. Do they not have an iPhone? You guys realize an iPhone is going to be better at tracking than an air tag because an iPhone at least has cellular. An iPhone won't have to like ping another iPhone in the find my network, but they listed TV remotes and that, that encouraged me to make today's video about why I was like TV remote. It doesn't really go out and about as much as AirPods or, or wallets or, or vehicles or drones. Those things all go all over the place. The TV remote, in my opinion, 99% of the time is in one room. So giving it find my capability in the U1 chip for one room is just a bit overkill to me. I think a speaker that you can just ping when you need to is fine. I don't think you need anything more than that. But a lot of people disagree. That's fine. I don't care. You're all entitled to your wrong opinion. 25% of respondents intended to buy the new iPad Pro with M1 chip. That was actually pretty high. That kind of, uh, that kind of surprised me, um, considering the new iMac uh, was at 14%. Only 14, as they, as they worded it. And about 25 are interested in this new iPad Pro. In spite of the Liquid Retina XDR Mini LED display, that's a mouthful. 
Can, do we have to say that every time? Liquid Retina XDR Mini LED <laughs> on the 12.9-inch model. This shocked me. I, I was surprised by this. But it says 66% of respondents intend to buy the smaller 11-inch model. I really did not see that coming. But I guess it's partially because a lot of people are probably maybe curious of the iPad getting the M1 chip. It's the first time that they've taken a chip from the Mac and put it in an iPad. And they want to see what that will entail, like software-wise, like at Quadruple UDC. They're hoping for pro applications. The only other reason I could think of people wanting to lean towards the 11-inch model is that um, the 12.9-inch model, while it does have XDR, is more expensive than it was before. And to be fair, for an iPad, it already was kind of up there at 1000 bucks, and now it's 1100 for the base model. And it can very, very quickly... Ugh, let's get that out of here. Um, it can very quickly jump up now that there's a $300 gap between these two iPads. $800, $1,100. Um, so if you're not careful and you're like, hey, I want 16 gigs of RAM, and hey, I want 5G, very quickly it's like, oh, that's two grand. I just spent two grand on an iPad, and then it does not come with a keyboard or pencil. Um, I like how they build this right into the configurator thing. Like, oh, make sure you get a keyboard at checkout. 12.9 inch is a big commitment because it's heavily it's heavily and harder to store. I don't think it's that heavy. I'm I'm using 12.9 inch right now. This this puppy is as light as a 13 inch display can really get. There's not really another way to have a 13 inch device that's this light. Even with the mini LED, I get that it's slightly heavier, but it's not a substantial heavier. Um even if the 12.9-inch iPad was the same price as the 11-inch, most people would still get the 11-inch. That's interesting to me because I, I want to know what these people are doing with the 11-inch iPad. Because in my opinion, the smart, uh, the Magic Keyboard here is so crammed and so compact on the 11-inch model. Like you have such a small keyboard you're working with. Um which is why, you know, when I reviewed the 11-inch iPad Pro last year, I really liked that form factor, but I didn't want it for a two-in-one design. I think if you're going to use your iPad just as an iPad most of the time and you're going to be using the touch interface and you don't plan on using that uh, external keyboard and trackpad with it, the 11-inch makes more sense um, because it's very comfortable to hold, you know, if you're using it on the couch or in bed and you're mainly just going to be interacting with the touch display. Um 11 inch makes more sense but you know if you're if you're using it for basic stuff like that well like, like why the 11 inch ipad pro and not the ipad air because that's 200 dollars cheaper i believe let me get this down here turn it off to 800 dollars for 128 gig i guess whereas ipad air is still 64 gigs at 600 so maybe that's it maybe people just want more storage yeah, as soon as you jump up to 256, you're only $50 away from the iPad Pro. So maybe it's underrated. Maybe there's a bunch of people that are that are down. It's crazy to me that this is like a $600 iPad and then the keyboard case is $300 on top of that. Oh, it's insanity. Um, I buy the 11 inch because if I wanted a 12.9 inch device, I would buy the MacBook. I use my iPad Pro when I travel, so being smaller and lighter makes more sense to me. I suppose so. It's a good size. I like that size. It's just interesting to me that so many people are planning on getting the new iPad Pro with the M1. I just wonder if, if these people had a certified refurbished 2020 iPad, would they get that instead? Or are they genuinely interested in getting an iPad with an M1 chip? Do they really care about the M1 performance? Or are they just, you know, they just want a light, compact iPad? That white keyboard looks so nice, but likely won't stay that way outside of Apple's product photography. <laughs> You're right, Alex. I'm sure. I'm sure that thing's going to get dirty very quickly. They want that one terabyte of storage. Yeah, check check around. Like, I wonder if Best Buy has any like 2020 iPad Pros going around right now. I'm going to move the reaction. Oop, wrong one. <laughs> I'm showing all these different cutaway shots. I was like, why do I put the React scene? Uh, uh, right at the bottom when I have the cam link scene. It's easier. Did you actually order the mini LED one? Yes, I did. I, I The main reason I'm sticking with the 12.9-inch form factor is because I do not want to have to buy another keyboard case. And I love the keyboard case. 
I'm a big fan of the Magic Keyboard and the trackpad user interface and stuff. So if I had the 11-inch keyboard case, I would probably still be sticking with the 11-inch. I'd be like, okay, I'll miss out on XDR, whatever. Um, in Germany, the certified refurbished still has an iPod category, but no iPhone category. That's funny. I was going to look up uh, on Best Buy or Amazon, you know, just look around for like a 2020. Um, I don't want you to know my location. I'm live streaming. Okay, 2020 iPad Pro. Let me see what I can find. I'm not showing it just because I don't want them to be like, here's your lo nearest location. Um, 700. Hey, that's cheaper, isn't it? And it comes with the... Uh, I think this is good. I, I'm trying to make sure I don't dox myself here. I don't think I am. Okay. Look at this. Save $100. $700 11-inch iPad Pro. 128 gigs. Wi-Fi only. Like, if you're looking for a small, compact iPad, this has high reviews. That's $60 worth of Apple Music it comes with. Like... What's wrong with this? Why why go for the M1 version? Why is that more interesting? Um, new iPhone needs to be made out of purely rubber for durability and stretchiness reasons. <laughs> Completely out of rubber. That makes sense. I don't know. I'd be very interested to see what people don't like about this iPad that the new iPad offers. Like, tell me. I must know. I want to know what the reason is. Okay, I'll I'll wrap this up here. I think we're near the end of the of the survey, not the live stream. Uh so yeah, more people sixty six percent of people wanted the eleven inch model. A massive eighty two percent of respondents want to see face ID added to future iMacs and MacBooks. That's very encouraging to me because I definitely am in that eighty two percent. I'm very shocked that there's still eighteen percent of people saying, like, nah, I don't want face ID on the iMac or MacBook. Like, really? What's wrong? Like, what? why do you hate Face ID so much? It feels like it would make perfect sense on a MacBook or an iMac. Come on. Um, for Apple's upcoming iPhone 13 lineup, 21% uh, want the return of Touch ID. That's actually pretty low. I would have assumed it was much higher than that. I, based on comments and people on Twitter, I thought it would have been like 50% of people, especially during the pandemic, would have wanted Touch ID to come back. It's kind of low to me to, that it's only 21 17 percent desire 120 hertz pro motion display i'm also kind of surprised by that because i know the average person doesn't really care about that type of thing but to know that t the return of touch id and 120 hertz are almost neck and neck they're only a couple of percent apart from each other 15 percent want a smaller notch or a notchless design also kind of neck and neck it's they're all pretty even and then 12 percent think the return of the power adapter included in the box is the most important potential feature that's really weird phrasing for me i don't know why you would say the most important feature is that the power brick still comes with the iphone i don't know why even 12 percent agreed that's the most important thing that i get a brick i was like yeah most people are going to be like yeah I, I got a charger i'm fine um only 5% of respondents want a smaller, more compact iPhone. I wonder if that's addressing the 12 mini or if it's not counting the 12 mini. Because, like, if I was in that camp, I would be like, yeah, the 12 mini is small enough. We don't need to go smaller than the 12 mini. But, um, yeah, a pretty small percentage care about smaller iPhones. Only 1%, this part was kind of shocking to me, 1% want a foldable design. That's pretty dang low if you think about how often people in the tech community talk about foldable iPhones and folding phones and the future of smartphones being foldables. Sorry for the lag. I see Starlink lagging. It's annoying. Come on, you can find your satellite, Starlink. You can do it. You can do it. Okay, we're back. Um, only 1% are interested in a foldable. That's pretty low, uh, considering how many different folding phones there are and how Samsung's trying to push it as hard as they can like we want folding phones folding phones are the future and then we pull like 3,000 ios users and they're like eh not really very little appetite to move to USB-C. that's depressing to me because i would be all about USB-C. only 0.8 percent wanting the removal of the lightning port well i wonder how they phrased that because if if they were asking you 
in this question like, okay, should we remove the lightning port? That's different than should we adopt USB-C? I bet if they phrased it as should Apple switch to USB-C, there probably would have been a lot more people saying like, yeah, I, I'm down for USB-C. It sounds like like 25% of these people plan on getting a new iPad Pro. That's quite a bit. And that uses Type-C. Uh, MacBook owners are using Type-C already. So... I bet it's the phrasing that's the reason that it's 0.8%, because if you just rephrased it as should they remove the lightning port, most people are probably going to assume that means do you want a portless iPhone? And I imagine there's very little urgency or interest in people getting a portless iPhone anytime soon. So you should run a USB-C poll? Eh, it's kind of pointless, I guess, because I know Apple's not going to do it. They just want to do a portless, but yeah, it's a shame. Asus Zenfote 8, it's pretty small and it's supposed to be the Android competitor to the 12 mini. Well, good luck with that. Just the name alone, I think, is going to prevent it from being any kind of threat to the 12 mini. I think 12 mini people are mainly just reminiscent of the iPhone 5 and 4 days, which means they're pretty hardcore iPhone people anyway. And people who buy Android are kind of comfortable with the bigger screens and that's what they're used to. So I don't. Seeing Apple not have tremendous success with the smaller iPhone makes me wonder if Android would do anywhere near as good as Apple did with the 12 mini. Well, Drew, do you want a portless iPhone? I wouldn't mind one. Um, I'm not like adamant that Apple needs to remove the lightning port right now. I'm like, I'm like they could remove it and I would still buy it. Like it's the lightning port for me in my personal life is not an important feature. It's not crucial. I could very comfortably, because I never use the lightning port on my iPhone right now. I charge it via MagSafe exclusively. So if they decided tomorrow we're going to make another 12 mini that's portless and the battery is better and you can just trade in your old 12 mini and get this new one for free, I would definitely, if I could just get a better battery life out of my 12 mini, but I lose the lightning port, I'd be all over that. I'd be like, cool, sounds good. Ditch the lightning port. Um, but uh, from a personal standpoint, I think it's too soon. Um, if from a business standpoint, maybe not so much a uh, personal standpoint, uh, like Apple's probably very proud and happy with MagSafe and they likely want the future of iPhone charging and, and power delivery to be MagSafe stuff. So if they can get MagSafe accessories and cables all over the globe and make it very commonplace thing, in my opinion, a good idea would be don't remove the lightning port just yet, but start shipping MagSafe cables with each iPhone, which I get would probably make it more expensive. And there's probably a cheaper way to make this. Like I'm looking at the MagSafe at my desk right now. Like the fact that it's all metal is probably overkill. It doesn't need to be metal. In fact, it would probably not scrape the glass as much if they just made like a plastic one. If they can make a cheaper version of MagSafe and then just start shipping that with every iPhone and then just make sure that everybody in uh, for a few generations at least has MagSafe cables around that they can switch to once the portless iPhone comes out, make MagSafe more obtainable. That's how I would pitch it and if we're taking the route of who needs a portless phone, like maybe removing the port isn't going to help very much with anything. And if, if that's the case, then I would just say USB-C. You know, I know Apple doesn't want to adopt a standard on the iPhone unless they keep it around for a long, long time. So the reason Apple probably hasn't switched to USB-C is because they don't think the port is going to stick around on the iPhone much longer. So they'd much rather just get rid of it now. Um, Apple try to get back to the roots. I, I think USB-C on the iPhone would be fine too. I, I wouldn't use it because, again, I do everything via MagSafe. But, again, I wouldn't mind it either if we just had Type-C on everything. That's the better port. I want light. There's not really anything where I think lightning needs to stay. I don't understand why with these new iMacs, the lightning connector is still on the Magic Keyboard and Magic Mouse, even though they're giving them new colors and they've redesigned them a bit. They still just do lightning just switch to type C at this point. Like what's the, what's the deal? Um, these Android phones really need better names. And this is coming from a Samsung user. <laughs> That's from Yusuf. Yeah. Asus Zen phone eight just doesn't roll off the tongue as well. I agree. I would hate Apple switching to USB C. I would have loved it five years ago, but between my phone, my AirPods, my Apple TV remote, my MagSafe duo and everything that I have, I would have to buy so many new cables leaving lightning as 
is might be annoying for some, but for the majority, it's fine. I agree for the majority, it's fine, but by that logic, we never should have switched to lightning. You know, because if you're going to use the argument of, I use a bunch of lightning stuff, therefore we should keep lightning forever, then people could have made that same argument with 30 pin. Even though lightning is better than 30 pin, there were a bunch of people with cars and chargers and docks and they had 30 pin cables everywhere and that's what they were used to so when apple came around with the lightning port on the iphone 5 there were a bunch of people angry that they were like well now i gotta got all new cables i gotta buy adapters i bought all this stuff like i remember my mom had a car um i think it was not the sonata i have currently but there was a sonata that she bought later that had like a 30 pin connector built into it um, that wasn't easy to replace. It like had to be, it was like built into the center console. And once lightning came around, obviously we had to buy that stupid little adapter that changes it from 30 pin to lightning. And that had to dock on top of the Sonata. And it was very clunky. And I was just like, yeah, I get it. A lot of people are using lightning right now. And Apple's made lightning so accessible across everything that it's going to be very, very hard to switch. But I don't think that means that we should keep lightning for a hundred years. You know, eventually there's better standards that come around. We got to adopt to them. Um, let's see. I would love type C on iPhone. So I don't have to carry two cords. That's how I feel. Cause with my iPad, I got to take USB C. And if you have a MacBook, many people do, uh, you got to take USB C. And the fact that if you're taking your iPhone and your Apple Watch with you, you have to carry around a whole separate cable alongside USB-C. I just wish Apple would commit. Right now they're going down the middle. I would feel differently if Apple was adopting Lightning on their MacBooks and stuff, and you were charging your MacBook Pros with high-powered, ultra-powerful Lightning or whatever. But that's not what happened. They switched to Type-C on the MacBooks. They switched to Type-C on the iPad Pros. Now they're bringing Type-C to the iPad Air, so more and more of the iPad line is adopting USB-C. Pretty much the entire MacBook line is USB-C. Now the iMac is all in on USB-C only. Um, so they're they're committing to two separate reversible symmetrical ports, and that's just confusing to me. Like, pick one. Pick one and stick with it. If you want to pick with Lightning, okay, I'll get behind Lightning. If you want to start adopting USB-C and bringing Type-C to more things, okay, then bring it to all things, not just a couple things, and then make everyone have to carry around two cables whenever they go somewhere. Um, AirPods Max would have been nice with USB-C. I agree. I, I agree as well. Especially when a lot of these accessories we're talking about come with cables anyway. Like, that's the thing. The new iMacs come with charger cables for the keyboard and mouse. Like, um they ship with one for you to charge it with because you know the the new iMac doesn't have USB-A ports which honestly I'm okay with USB-A going away cuz I've always hated USB-A but um even when it was the standard even before type C I I just hated the design of USB-C but in the box uh they include the cable I'm trying to find the part in the text specs where it says that but they don't have a picture of it whatever you 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 know what I mean it's probably on the order page, but if you're going to ship a new cable with the iMac and you've redesigned the Magic Keyboard to accommodate Touch ID and have all these new colors, if you're going to redesign all this stuff anyway, then just switch to Type-C. Like, just do it right there. Here it is. This was the stupid picture I was looking for. They're still including... Oh, and it's colored! Look at that. <laughs> Not only are they shipping USB-C to Lightning cables, they're making a brand new type of USB-C to Lightning cable. Even though they made a brand new keyboard and a new mouse with new colors and everything, just switch the keyboard and mouse to Type-C. That way you can plug in whichever end of the cable you want. Um, this would be the perfect time to start switching things away from Lightning. I don't know why they don't feel like doing it then. Um, because with USB-C to Lightning, you got to go, wait, is this the Type-C end or is this the Lightning end? Which one goes into the back of the iMac? Oh, only this one can go in the back. If it's Type-C, it doesn't matter. You can plug in this end of the back, this end of the keyboard. It, you know, it's they're interchangeable. And that's why I love Type-C is because it's so versatile. But, oh, well. Oh, well. All current Lightning devices ship with USB-C to Lightning. Yeah, there's no Lightning to Lightning either. That's what's kind of prevented me from liking Lightning is that the whole beauty of Type-C is it can be the same connector on both sides. Um, 
same thing with the iPad. You know, you don't have to check which which end do I plug into the brick and which one do I plug into the iPad. Like, it's so simple to just be like, plug it into the brick and then the other end into the iPad. Which one goes into the brick? Doesn't matter. Either one. You can go either way. Um, do you think they will put those magnetic pins on the iPad on the bottom of the portless iPhone or will that space be filled in with speaker holes or just something there? What do you mean, the smart connector? I don't think the iPhone needs a smart connector unless there's some type of module accessory they plan on docking to it, but they're kind of already doing that with MagSafe. So, yeah, I don't I don't see them bringing the smart connector to the iPhone. There were rumors of that a few years ago, but it never turned into anything. Um, my guess it would be it would just be better speakers or better microphone or something. I know it would look a little weird at first, but so did removing the headphone jack originally. I think I think it'd look fine. They'd probably just replace it with some redesigned speaker layout. Um, I remember buying the Lightning VGA adapter to show a movie at school, and then it was blocked for copyright, even though I got it on iTunes. <laughs> that sucks. Dang it. Uh, USB-C is for high power or high speed devices. Lightning is low power and low data bandwidth stuff. Yeah, but I would agree with you if Apple wasn't doing... Um, let me pull up the picture. I would agree with you if Apple wasn't doing this. They're putting Type-C on the iMac in replacement of the SD card and USB-A and HDMI and stuff. And they're having full-speed Thunderbolt ports and low-speed Type-C ports. And the iPad has had low-speed Type-C, which is just USB 3.0 for a while. And now even the iPad Air is is rocking type c this is not a po a pro device you know this is the pro but this is the air they're adopting type c here so to me they've already shown that they're willing to take type c in the more affordable playful direction um even on low bandwidth stuff so i don't know it seems seems backwards to me sorry for the lag starlink is acting up again um Let's see. If that iMac keyboard compatible with the iPad Pro is a Bluetooth keyboard? I wonder. That's what I've been asking myself. Is like They said that Touch ID needs the M1 chip to work on the Bluetooth Magic Keyboard. And I'm like, hey, iPad has M1. So can they work together or something like that? I don't know. I'll try. Probably not. I wonder, I'm, I'm guessing the Magic Keyboard will pair to the iPad in type. But the Touch ID won't unlock it or anything. The Touch ID just becomes pointless. Um... Did your stuff ship yet from Apple? My iPad shipped. My iPad shipped yesterday, um, and it still says arriving May 21st. My iMac has not shipped, nor my Apple TV, and that's fine, by the way. I'm in no rush to see the iMac, but I am interested to try out the new iPad, so I'm happy it's shipped. Um, did I see the new Pixel 6, Pixel 6 Pro? Yeah, I thought we might talk about that on the stream. That would make sense. Um let me find a good picture of it here. Um, so this was reported on from Mr. Front Page Tech, Mr. John Prosser, um, who has a okay track record. With Pixel stuff, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just not remembering things as clearly, but I recall a lot of Pixel leaks from him that didn't end up happening. Um, but this is essentially the leak that he's worked on with Renders by Ian, a uh, shout out to Renders by Ian. He did a great job with this. It looks very legit. It looks quite official, in my opinion. Um, I I don't know. Someone in Discord pointed out to me that this looks like the top of an eraser, like on a pencil. You know, you got the eraser, you got the metal piece, and then the wood here. And ever since he mentioned that, I can't unsee it. It does kind of look like an eraser to me. It's very weird. It's quite unique, but in the smartphone world, I mean, I'm not here to hate on people doing unique designs. I mean, one benefit I could see of a raised camera bump across the top like this is it probably won't rock very much when you're leaving it flat on a table. It'll probably be angled up a little bit um, when you lay it down flat. And a lot of people have said they actually like this design. I, I think I'll agree... I haven't stared at it very much. I just saw a few pictures of it uh, before going live. Now that I'm staring at it, you guys are catching my live reaction. Um, yeah, I don't think it's terrible. I've definitely seen worse pixel designs. Um, having the one camera cut out 
it was a good call. Um, I hope these are 120 hertz refresh rate displays. I like I, I understand that Google likes their dual color. It's just kind of pointless design, I think, is my thing. Like, well, that's that's the thing, Yusuf. This isn't really ripping off the S21. This is just what all Android phones look like now. And that's kind of the problem that Android is running into. Apple's running into the same issue. But all Android phones basically just come down to where do you want your camera hole? It's like a full-size display that goes right to the edge. And then the camera hole is either in the center or off to the side. And that's it. There's no other option. Um, so I don't I don't consider this a copycat. I just I, I look at this as a smartphone problem. It's like everything is turning into this uh, in the smartphone world. Having the cameras lower and having this open piece of glass at the top, I mean, if that served some type of functional benefit, I I could get behind it a little bit. Maybe that's where they put the 5G modems or something, but... If that's just for the sake of design, I do agree. It's kind of weird. Uh, I I don't love it. I just don't think it's terrible. Um, there's dumber ways to make a camera design on the back. That's for sure. Uh, they're going with the centered logo, at least according to this one. But in my experience, like I remember early, I think it was early 2020, or maybe it was 2019 when... John was so convinced that he had the Pixel 5 renders and it had this crazy triple camera module on the back and it looked terribly ugly and that didn't end up happening. That wasn't accurate. So I could very easily see this not happening too just because of how wacky and weird it is. And sometimes when there's a very wacky, weird render floating around many, many months before um, the product is actually unveiled, that's usually when it's not super accurate. But could be legit. I don't know for sure, but I, I just think it's kind of pointless. But, you know, so many phones are looking pretty identical these days. I guess it makes sense for Google to do something somewhat unique. You know what I was thinking about when I was just looking at this back camera design here? Oh, I don't know why that shows up. Um, the Surface Duo got, like, its price cost in, cut in half, which is never a good sign. I, <laughs> I think when they cut the price in half, that means that they're just trying to clear out inventory because no one's buying it. But um, how would this do with phone cases? I have a feeling this wouldn't be very good for phone cases because the phone case would have to kind of accommodate for this giant cutout on the back and... I don't know. There's probably a way to do it all right, but I wonder about the structural integrity of the case if you're going to have a big cutout across the top like that. So, yeah. I would probably be more disappointed if this was a leaked iPhone design because I do find it kind of bizarre looking. And a lot of the time, smartphone makers um, uh, will cover the the smartphone lenses with sapphire infused glass that's what apple does at least with their lenses and when you have a very very large black module like that um you typically have to make the whole thing sapphire glass which might be more expensive and more prone to shattering so making more of the back that that sapphire it's it's less scratch resistant but it's more prone to breaking when you drop a device so I wonder if this is worse structural integrity-wise for the uh, sapphire glass, unless maybe they're deciding to just not do sapphire glass on the camera modules. That's also possible. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of weird. I agree. It looks like a, the eraser end of a pencil. Getting Touch ID underneath the display, that's probably a good call. I wonder what they're going to price it at, too. Google's been always just on this bumpy back and forth design trend, like, oh, we don't believe in this. And then the next year, actually, we do believe in that. And then we actually, we don't believe in that. You know, they keep going back and forth. I would love to give you more rants, but there has to be things to rant about. I'm not going to rant for no reason. And I'll rant whenever I find something rant worthy. Um, and now people get mad if I rant about something Apple does, so... <laughs> there's no pleasing you people um the price on half would be too expensive yeah surface duo is not worth 700 dollars to me either i wouldn't recommend it really to anybody 
even for a hundred dollars i don't think i would recommend it <laughs> it's like no don't buy that it's it's not fun i'm I'll, i'm all for weird phone de designs nowadays phones look too similar they all do especially from the back but that's the thing there's not a great solution to it because if uh the solution is to just make even more weird camera designs on the back. I, I don't think that's going to save them. I don't think that's going to make the phone more appealing. I don't know of anybody that's going to buy a phone because they like the way it looks on the back. Like, I don't know. Especially not a Pixel. If it was an iPhone, maybe. <laughs> you got a bit more of that brand loyalty on that side. Pixel doesn't really have that same amount of brand loyalty. So I don't really share that. I don't really share that sentiment. Now that we're talking about pricing, do you know why the 11 Pro are still much more expensive as the 10s were last year around the same time? Well, I don't know because Apple's not selling it, so it's not on Apple's end as to why the 11 Pro is still much more expensive. I'm guessing it's because of supply and demand. I have to imagine Apple is not really making 11 Pros anymore for the most part. There might be a couple of lines briefly open, but... Um, it's probably because uh, there's a lot of 10s's available and not that many people buying them, and the 11 Pro uh, is a bit more high in demand, so people are more quick to buy that one. Like I'm looking at the certified refurbished page right now, and there's a lot of uh, 10s's and 10s Maxes, but the 11 Pro 64 gig is 760 from Apple. Whereas the 10s 64 gig is 64 gig is 640, so it's about a hundred bucks in between those two generations. I could understand most people wanting to get the 11 Pro because it's for the better battery, better display, better camera. So uh, you know, it makes sense that the newer one would be more expensive. Um, Microsoft would have to give you a thousand dollars to use it. Yes, <laughs> I would. I would take the Surface Duo for a thousand dollars if you gave me a thousand dollars. Sure. You meant from third parties, as in 10s in May of 2020 versus 11 Pro now? I haven't compared those types of prices in the past. I'm guessing it's because the 10s battery life was not very good, and maybe the 11 Pro battery was pretty good, so there's a lot more people interested in buying the 11 Pro. You know, they like that frosted glass back. It's got the centered logo, so it seems more up to date. It's got the triple camera system, whereas the 10s has that glossy glass back. It's very similar to the 10. So maybe people just weren't as interested in buying that one in the used market, in third parties at least. Um, thoughts on how Apple Glass will change our lives? I guess it basically allows us to put third party, I mean not third party, uh, 3D holograms everywhere we look. So if you want, you know, if I was using an iMac and I was like, I don't want bezels and chins anymore, I could just blow up the screen for my glasses, you really wouldn't need pixels much anymore. Uh, you could just have slabs of glass that the hologram displays information on. You could just sit down at a desk and have a screen of infinite size in front of you. You could paste TVs everywhere, and you could have all kinds of 3D hologram games, um, all kinds of advertising that could be done for people wearing Apple Glass. It'll definitely be a big deal, but I don't think it's a. I don't think it's that close. I don't think it's like coming out next year i think i want it to come out as soon as possible i just i don't think the tech is ready yet i think they're waiting for it to have a really good battery life and for the design to be very thin and light and for the visuals to be very immersive and have good eye tracking and that kind of stuff is just the tech is not ready yet um for apple glass to change our life it first needs to be real exactly exactly i <laughs> it's like if we want starlink to change our lives it needs to come out. That's the first priority. But yeah, like having multiple people watch a TV is still going to be fundamentally cheaper than everybody buying their own pair of Apple Glass. Uh, Apple Glass in June? Don't think so. I don't think we're getting Apple Glass for many years, probably. I'd love to be proven wrong. You know, Prosser was the one who said we would be getting an Apple Glass unveiling in March of this year, <laughs> here we are. That didn't quite happen. So yeah, it's, I think that we're not going to see Apple glass until there's been, uh, a couple other companies coming out with similar tech. Cause Apple is very rarely first to something like that. 
So the fact that no one really else in the tech industry has released anything like Apple Glass makes me think Apple's probably not anywhere close. Because Microsoft HoloLens is not anywhere near what people are expecting Apple Glass to be. Apple Glass is meant to be this like consumer level, you know, wearable like the Apple Watch that you just like take out and throw on and it just starts working. Whereas HoloLens is like this developer kit, $3,000 terrible battery life, giant helmet looking headset that's not consumer friendly at all. It's mainly for developer usage and it's not for everyday people. Um, I was expecting Apple Glass to be north of $1,000. I don't, I don't think they'll, I have a hard time believing they'll get the price below a grand. Um, just based on how expensive the tech is currently. Um, when can I order Apple Glass? I need to change the glass in my windows. Should I wait for Apple's take on glass or buy what is on the market now? You'll be waiting a while if you're waiting for Apple. Um, let's see. When does the beta period, period end for Starlink? They said later this summer. So I'm guessing July or August is when these dropouts should hopefully be gone. Uh entirely um but right now yeah they're still in the beta period and it's still a little bit bumpy it has for the most part gotten better but every once in a while you do get those big cutouts which is frustrating um but i'm willing to support the mission i'm willing to put up with it because comcast was substantially more expensive and they had terrible customer service and their speeds and coverage or whatever was not getting better and they were just deciding to charge us for more money every month. So I was like, I ain't rewarding Comcast. I don't care. I'm leaving them behind. And Starlink is slowly but surely getting better and better, which I appreciate. So you can't win them all. But you need to hear me be angry for half an hour. <laughs> I'm going to rant about ranting. I'm going to rant about the people asking about rant videos. How about that? You think iOS 15 will have a redesign? I'm thinking the icons will be more Big Sur-like. They could. Software is something that's very easy for Apple to keep to themselves. So th there's not a lot of leaks when it comes to iOS and stuff. But um, yeah, I could see the icons maybe getting slightly tinkered to be more like Big Sur. I've seen a lot of packs people have gotten where it looks like Big Sur icons on the iPhone. And I think it looks pretty nice. I kind of dig the look. So I wouldn't mind if they started doing that, but um, at the end of the day, they, they whenever you redesign an operating system, you take this big risk of ticking people off. Every time Apple does this fundamental OS redesign, everyone's like, ew, it's gross, I hate it, it sucks. And that's what people are saying on Discord right now. You know, the new Discord redesign sucks, I hate it, it looks gross. It's just anytime you show people a new design that they're not used to, they instantly hate it. Um, including me, especially with white bezels, but, <laughs> um, that's, that's something I've been very consistent on since the dawn of time. But, uh, I think you could have a very similar reaction if they fundamentally just redesign all the icons with iOS. People are going to be like, ew, gross. It's terrible. Um, so I can understand why Apple's not in a big rush to redesign it. Plus you get like all the first party apps update and then the third party apps don't update. So you have like these conflicting design languages that don't go together. And one of them is more simplistic and minimal. And the other one is not very simplistic and more, I don't know. I'm not in a big rush for them to redesign iOS. I'm just for them getting rid of the pop-ups. Like I don't need the 15% battery warning jumping up and turning off the whole display. It can just be a little notification that drops down and goes away. And I don't need pop-ups all the time. They just work on those pop-ups, maybe some more home screen customization. You know, you can let people put the apps wherever they want or whatever, you know, just do what you got to do. But the fundamental redesigns, I, I get why it's not top priority. I think iPad OS will be the big change this year. iOS seems in a pretty good place. Yeah, iOS is probably due for interactive widgets. I would appreciate that, like a, a now playing widget where I can just like pause music, skip music, and that kind of stuff. Um, and iPad OS. I'm mainly interested in pro applications. I don't really have much interest in the OS itself changing very much. Like, yeah, putting widgets anywhere on the home screen, I guess. It looks kind of weird in concepts, but there's probably a clean, simple way of doing it. But iPad OS did not get a big update last year. So, yeah, I'm hoping there's a bigger one this year. Have my Starlink speeds increased or is it still the same? 
It varies a lot, but generally speaking, it has increased. I've noticed the uploads getting faster. And when I first got it, it was about 100 down most of the time on average. And now when I do the speed tests, I typically can get over 200. But it changes by the minute a lot. Like one minute you'll do a speed test and it's like 60 down. And I'm not exaggerating. Like 30 seconds later, you can do another speed test and now it's 250. It'll go all the way up to that. And I've seen people in the Bay Area doing speed tests. They're getting 400 down and and 50 up and i'm not getting those speeds it could be because i have a bunch of devices all connected at the same time but the amount of time it's taken to upload videos has in, uh, decreased it's gotten better in terms of uploading and occasionally we have like a massive outage like that like we did with the live stream but other times i'll just go through a whole stream and there will barely any be any any frame drops which is nice so it depends it's it's very volatile, but generally speaking, it has gotten better. Um, maybe you come this year over 40k what you pay to Apple. Yeah, probably. Starlink is still in beta. They have not they have not delivered any uh, dishy McFlat faces to people outside of the beta program. Um, they let you pre-order Starlink, so they got a gauge of demand of how many people want one, but. Um, Everybody who's using it right now is still on the better than nothing beta. It's impressive Starlink reaches such fast speeds. I only get 100 down and up at my home. 100 up, I have yet to see Starlink do. I would love to have 100 down and up. I don't really care much about download. I just want upload. But um, I know that if I wanted to downgrade my Comcast plan, I would have to put up with slower upload speeds and they would not get better. See, that's part of the reason I'm interested in Starlink is because I know it's going to get faster and improve connection over time, whereas Comcast was not improving. Um, and they were not super reliable. I mean, sometimes they would cut out not as much as Starlink, but they would. And the rates were getting more expensive. It was like, oh, no, our service went out and now we're going to charge you extra. And it was not fun. I didn't like rewarding Comcast for that behavior. So I was like, I want to support SpaceX. I'll put up with the beta period, but I'm I'm anticipating by the end of this year it won't be as bu bumpy. Um, I want working internet, but I don't really want to give Elon Musk my money. <laughs> well, Elon Elon is not getting directly paid from SpaceX. He's paid mostly through company performance reviews. Like if the if the most of the guy's money is tied up in stocks, not like. We have decided this week we are going to pay Elon Musk $3 billion for his help with the company. Like, that's not most of his net worth. Um, if you're paying for Starlink, you're basically paying for reusable rockets. That's where all that SpaceX money is going. And they're paying for the colonization of Mars. That's where all their money is going. It's not going into Elon Musk's pocket. Elon sold a bunch of his possessions for dirt cheap. Um He's not he's not doing all this for money. <laughs> he, if he takes money, it's because he wants to put it towards a mission that he believes in. You really think uh, Neuralink will be that powerful and game changing? If it does what uh, the company is setting out to do, yes. I think it's a very, very long term. I don't think Neuralink is going to be game changing within the next couple of years. Um, the company itself has admitted that. They've said, like, our first priority with Neuralink is to make tech that improves people with neurological disorders so people with brain issues or or paraplegics i think the term is or people that need to reinstate a different part of their brain that's not working correctly at the moment Neuralink will help them uh, but then in the long term they plan on making Neuralink more like adding features and making it more like everyday people will get it and it will improve their cognitive abilities. Like you can look things up directly through your mind. Like you don't have to search Google anymore. You just have access to all that information or you can control a smartphone without having to touch it or you can text or communicate with people without having to use your thumbs. You know, basically just their whole mindset is like you're already a cyborg. You already use your phone and your watch all the time. And the only issue is the latency between your watch and your phone is very slow. It's limited to your fingers and the touch screen. Um, and over time, they hope to improve that. But I still think it's it could very easily be decades before that kind of thing happened. It, it could be 
2030 by the time they actually start advertising Neuralink as like a consumer product that people without neurological issues would want. Be like, hey, you can buy this now and you can just instantly learn a new language like very quickly. Like you could build Google Translate into people's minds essentially. So if they actually start achieving the types of goals they're setting out for themselves, then yes, it will be game changing. And I do think you shouldn't necessarily doubt you know, Elon Musk projects considering how crazy most of the businesses and projects he sets out to do and then he usually ends up achieving them. Um, do they happen within his time frame? Almost never. It's almost always a lot later or takes a lot longer than he thinks it's going to take. But in time, it usually does end up happening. So when you have someone who's as successful with as decent of a track record as Elon Musk saying, these are the types of things we want Neuralink to do, there's some reasonable expectations to imagine that could happen um, within the next couple decades. But I don't think it's like a in the next five years type thing. It, it'll be a while. It's not going to it's not going to sneak up on you. Um, did you watch the Elon Musk SNL episode? I've never been a big fan of SNL. I've just tried to watch them in the past and I I've, I've never found them very funny. I've found some really really like decade old several decade old SNL skits that were pretty funny, but m most recent generation SNL I've never found quite humorous. And I watched a couple of the clips from the Elon Musk SNL and it was pretty much what I remembered. It's like a lot of people assumed that if Elon Musk was this on SNL it would mean he was writing the skits. It was like, no, there's still other people writing them. He's just acting in them. And I guess it's kind of funny slash interesting to see Elon Musk be in some crappy, poorly written skit, but I did not laugh a single time. I didn't even get like a, a nose exhale. I wasn't even like, <laughs> I was just like, what? What's the joke? I like. I didn't find it humorous. So I watched a couple clips and I was like, okay, I get it. And I just, I didn't watch the whole thing. <laughs> SNL's never been that funny to me. Like growing up, it's never, there's never been that many skits that I thought were humorous. The chip is in my computer, not in my head. Yeah, now, but in the future, it might be different. No max tech on the pod. Okay. We'll, we'll have some new, we'll have some more guests. We're, there's a lot of people that we want to have on the podcast. Um, in fact, there's probably a pretty interesting one coming on that you guys probably will be excited for, but I won't reveal it. I'll, I'll keep it to myself. It's a secret. But I appreciate you all for tuning in. I think I'm going to be signing off now, but I appreciate the bits. I got EV coming up in a little bit. And uh, thank you all for watching. Hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.